Are you a businesswoman who is finding it challenging to get your ideas across and make a point? Welcome to Speakers Who Get Results with Elizabeth Bachman, a podcast dedicated to helping women get the visibility they want, whether making a speech or talking in a meeting. Every week, get valuable lessons from Elizabeth or learn from her roundtable conversations with experts and speakers on how to make a difference, not just a point. On to the show with your host, Elizabeth Bachman. Hello, and welcome to Speakers Who Get Results. This is Elizabeth Bachman, your host, and this is the podcast where we talk about communication, leadership, and strategic thinking. And my guest today is the incredible Dory Clark. I'll tell you about her in a minute. But before we get to the interview, I'd like to invite you to see how your presentation skills are doing, how they're serving you, by taking our free four-minute assessment at speakforresultsquiz.com. That's www.speakforresultsquiz.com. And that's where you can see where you are showing up as a leader and it's benefiting you and where perhaps a little bit of extra time, uh, extra support could get you the results you need and the recognition that you deserve. My guest today is the awesome Dory Clark. I've been following her for quite some time and um, learned about her from friends. She's been named one of the top 50 business thinkers in the world by Thinkers 50. I think that's been twice, so two years in a row. Uh, She helps individuals and companies get their best ideas heard in a crowded, noisy world. And Dory was honored as the number one communications coach by the Marshall Goldsmith Leading Global Coaches uh, uh, Coaches Awards and one of the top five communication professionals in the world by Global Gurus. She's a keynote speaker and teaches for Columbia Business School, as well as several other very important uh, universities. She's the Wall Street Journal best-selling author of The Long Game, also Entrepreneurial You, Reinventing You, and Stand Out, which was named as the number one leadership book of the year by Inc. Magazine. Uh, We're going to be talking about The Long Game today because in this very busy world, how do you find the time to do the important strategic thinking that will advance your company or advance your career? Dory's also a former presidential campaign spokeswoman, and she's been described as the New York Times as an expert in self-reinvention and helping others make changes in their lives. She's also a frequent contributor to the Harvard Business Review, consults and speaks for clients such as Google, Yale University, and the World Bank. Forbes has declared that her insights connect marketing, social media, communications, learning technologies, and personal discovery to give us a blueprint for success in the future economy. Dory is a graduate of Harvard Divinity School and a producer of of a multiple Grammy-winning jazz album and also a Broadway investor. She's also written a Broadway show, which is in uh, in development now. So I don't know how she has time. (laughs) If you are interested in learning more, you can download her free long game strategic thinking self-assessment at doryclark.com slash the long game. I have been trying and trying to get Dory Clark onto this podcast, and we finally connected today and had a most delightful conversation full of interesting things. I know you'll have a good time. Here comes Dory Clark. Dory Clark, welcome to Speakers Who Get Results. Hi, Elizabeth. Good to be here. I'm so happy to have you. I've been following you for quite some time and uh, took some took some machinations to get you. So yeah. I gotcha. All right. (laughs) I really love talking to you about one of your many topics of long-term strategic thinking. But before we start, the question I ask all my guests is, if you could interview somebody who's no longer with us, 
Who would it be? What would you ask them? And who should be listening? Amazing, amazing questions. So I um, I always have a, a little bit of a uh, historical affinity to Theodore Roosevelt. Um, ah. He's kind of indirectly my namesake. I am a Theodora. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I think I think he's a, he's a little bit out of favor now, you know, for his sort of um, imperial mustachioed bravado. Um, but, uh, but he, he was a really interesting guy and, um, you know, just such a, such a unique thinker. Certainly some of his, uh, his quotes have endured. I mean, Brene Brown has, you know, f- famously sort of popularized one of, you know, one of his, but you know, it's the, it's the man in the arena. Yeah. The right. Critic doesn't count and all of that. My favorite Theodore Roosevelt quote is uh, a different one, which, uh, you know, seems very Theodore Roosevelt, at least in terms of like, you know, the brand that has come down over time, which is in any moment of, uh, of, of crisis or sort of high stakes decision, the best thing you can do is the right thing. The next best thing you can do is the wrong thing. And the worst thing you can do is nothing. And I'm like, yeah, you know, that's, that's right. You gotta, you gotta make the move. So, uh, so I respect that. So I, I think it would be a very interesting conversation with him. Ah, uh, good. What would you ask him? You know, I think um, one, you know, one of his sort of lasting things, of course, that uh, that has stayed with us is about uh, conservation and national mm-hmm. parks. And so I would be really interested in getting his take on climate change, actually. That was not Ooh. a thing that a uh, hundred plus years ago people were were really uh, thinking about or, or needed to think about, I suppose, at the time. But uh, I'd be fascinated with what his perspective is on uh, on that pressing contemporary issue. I, I think actually it'd be really interesting to ask him about the political opposition he faced in creating yeah. national parks and saying, wait a minute, this is not all, not every resource belongs to us, the privileged elite. Maybe we should save some for the people or the planet. And I am sure he got a lot of pushback for that. So that would be a really interesting conversation. Cool. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that would that would be lots of fun. And uh, and I'll tell you that quote, the one that Brene Brown talks about, my dad had on his wall for years. And uh, and when he closed up, when he retired and then set up a little office in an extra room, of the many things from his official office, that's the one that went up on the wall in the back bedroom when he just set up his desk back there. So um, I know it well, <laughs> many times, I've read it many times, long before Brene Brown ever read yeah, something Yeah, like there we that. go. Oh, gee, I like it. Yeah, cool. So Dory, you talk about so many things, uh, but I'd like to ask you today about long-term strategic thinking, why it's so important and why we don't make time to do it. Help. It's so true, uh, Elizabeth. And in fact, one of the things that set me on the path to thinking about this actually was in, gosh, I want to say it was 2018. I was invited to speak at a conference in in your hood in Austria. Um, it was every year in Vienna they have a annual sort of tribute conference to Peter Drucker, the great management yeah. thinker. And so I was asked to speak there and give a short talk about strategy. That was that was basically the mm-hmm. mandate. Is like you know something about strategy and uh, so, you know which is fairly broad. So I was trying to think about what would be interesting, what would be useful. And as I was pondering it, what I realized was that to me, the thing that was interesting, um, especially interesting about strategy is the fact that unlike a lot of things in contemporary business life, there's not really any opposition. It's not like there's sort of an anti-strategy faction. Basically, everyone agrees that strategy is a great thing. Yes, we should do that. We should all be long-term thinkers. Yay. But you know the the problem is not that we th- you know don't think it's a good idea. The problem is that we think it's a good idea and we don't do it. It's you know it's almost like going to the gym. You know there's there's no one who thinks that exercise oh, yeah. is horrible, but we still don't do it. And mm-hmm. so I began to to sort of go down the rabbit hole of trying to understand well what what is the problem? What gets in the way here? And so that 
ultimately led me on the path to writing my book, The Long Game, How to Be a Long-Term Thinker in a Short-Term World. But I will say that one of the interesting statistics that stood out to me most when I was researching it was there were a pair of studies that were done you know, just around the same time as each other. And one study, which was conducted by the management research group, it was a, a study of, of 10,000 senior leaders. And they asked them, you know, what, if you have to pick one thing, what is most critical? What is most important in being uh, a, a successful leader? And 97% had the same answer. They said, long-term thinking, strategy, that's what's important. And meanwhile, in a separate study, um, there, you know, they surveyed executives about, you know, your your challenges you were facing, and ninety six percent of them said they did not have time for strategic uh -huh, thinking. You're right. So, right. I mean, just that that pair together, ninety seven percent say it's the number one most important thing. Ninety six percent say they don't have time for it. Clearly, there's a disconnect, and it's one that is worth solving. Aha. Uh -huh. So. I, I, this is something I work with, you know, with my clients all the time is they're always putting out fires and, and then to take the time to think about long term about your career about setting yourself up as a thought leader, you actually have to do the homework, you have to do sit down and think about what you what your talking points are. And what do you think? Um, certainly in writing a book, you've got to take the time how do you do it? Well, there's a lot of answers to that, and we can definitely go into depth about any of them. But for me, what, what I've discovered is the starting point in a lot of ways. I mean, the things that crowd out our ability to do strategy, I mean, some of, some of them, let's be honest, are sort of more subterranean and more psychological. Sometimes it's avoidance. Sometimes it's, you know, trying to sort of bury yourself in, in work, et cetera. But at a really pedestrian level, almost all of us are plagued by very banal things. Uh, we have too many meetings. We have too many emails. And so as a result, we feel like we, we can essentially never get to the good stuff because we're always you know triaging mm -hmm. our inboxes. And so one of the most important things that we can do is to actually set up rigorous barriers and rigorous boundaries for ourselves so that we actually have some white space. We actually have some time to attend to things. I mean, you know, I'm not perfect at this either. I mean, part of the reason I'm doing this work is to kind of teach myself as we, as we often do. But, you know, if you have a day that is interrupted in such a staccato fashion that you've got a meeting, then you've got 15 minutes, you've got another meeting, then you have maybe 30 minutes, then you've got another two meetings. Mm -hmm. You're not going to be able to do any kind of intellectually meaningful project during that time because, you know, for a big project, it takes a while to kind of get into it, to remind yourself of the nuances. All you're going to have time to do is answer a few emails and then you're on to the next thing. So mm -hmm. a lot of it, the starting point is about really getting clear and creating systems for yourself to have the necessary white space. And that that is hard. It's hard emotionally for people to turn things down, to say no, but that is the necessary prerequisite to be able to give yourself the space for strategy. So what do you mean by white space? So white space, you know, I mean, in a, in a literal sense, I mean, this is a term that gets thrown around, but it actually is a very literal term. It means if you have a calendar, you know, whether it is a paper calendar, whether it is an electronic calendar, um, when you have a meeting, you know, like mo Monday at 9 a.m. or whatever, you fill it in. You're either filling yeah. it in with black ink and writing it or on your computer. It's like now it's it's sort of a blue square that gets filled in. And if you are scanning your calendar and it's like, an ocean of blue or, you know, whatever your chosen mm -hmm. color is, you're not actually going to have the ability to do a lot of deep thinking because your, your presence, at least, you know, your nominal presence is going to be required at so many things. There, there's not an oasis in the day for you to do it. You're going to be racing around like a chicken with your head cut off. You need larger unstructured blocks of time. That is, that is, um, you know, necessary. It's not to say you need six weeks at an ashram, you know, that's yeah. probably not possible. It's probably not likely, but do you need more than 30 minutes in a day? Yeah, you probably do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, actually the ones that have worked the best for me is when I have another, another person, uh, an, an acquaintance who wants to do the same thing. And we have every four weeks, every two weeks, if we can, but we, 
we have get it done time. Yeah, yeah. And we and we actually we turn on Zoom and mm-hmm. minimize it. You know, turn off that, but we stay online so that you can see that the other person is actually working. That's right. Yes. Because actually just promising you will still doesn't work because you're still going to get distracted. So um, not to mention the things you, you know, for those of us who are working from home, the things you need to do about laundry and fixing that spot that's broken and, you know, things like that, which I never allow enough time for and then then oh whoops here's here's something I can postpone because I really have to do the laundry instead so that kind of to recognize that you need those times yeah absolutely and I, I love your strategy I mean in fact there's literally a whole business that has come up based on the premise of what you're talking about I mean obviously people can do it informally like you have but I have a colleague who started a business called Cave Day and people, you know, literally will pay money to, uh, you know, if they don't have a friend who will do it with them, they get paired, you know, with a group of people or, you know, or one-on-one and, uh, and, you know, sort of do that kind of sustained focused work as a kind of forcing function or an accountability mechanism. Yeah. And then, then it's on the calendar. So, um, or if you have an admin who is managing calendars don't tell them not to let you to book something during lunch yeah not yeah. To, don't have your admin say don't let me say yes that's right that's I've right. had quite a few clients who've done that and then they say I have no time to think I said well yet you had this you know you didn't take time to to eat so who said yes you could say no yep yeah, that's a. It is a systemic issue. Um, I know that's that's one of the things. But then, if you've got this nice, say you've got two hours every other Friday blocked off, how do you make sure you're using that for the right, the right purposes? You, you, yeah, that you're going to actually get something out of it. Yeah, it's a it's a good question, of course, because you know, if I, I feel like a similar analogy would be like writing a book, right? Like part of the there's a lot of people I know who want to write a book. This is their goal. And, you know, part of the battle is allocating time on your calendar to write the book, you know, freeing up all the stuff. Okay, now I'm gonna do it. So this is great. This is a victory. So let's say they put two hours on their calendar Friday afternoon. I'm gonna write this book. But because they haven't actually gotten down to a level of granularity about what this is going to look like. All they have on their calendar is write book. And then ah. they sit there and they're like, oh God, how do I write a book? <laughs> like, where do I start? And they just sit there and are overwhelmed for two hours, uh, which is not terribly helpful. So similarly, I think that many people have a kind of similar um, you know, view of like the portentous nature of like do strategy that, mm-hmm. yeah, this is, this is this, you know, uh, kind of world shatteringly important thing that has to be done with a stentorian voice. And, uh, and I, I think that that almost necessarily intimidates people. It means they kind of get frozen up. They don't do it. They procrastinate even when the time is on their calendar. So you're right that this is worth drilling down on. So, the quick like back of the envelope way that I like to define, you know, doing strategy. I mean, there's a lot of ways you can do it. Obviously you can do it with your team and things like that. But when we're doing it for ourselves, I really like the frame and sort of asking the question, what is it I can do today that will make tomorrow easier and better? That is the question that I ask myself. And I feel like that brings it down to a more kind of human level, essentially, Mm -hmm. because all right, I may not know like what my life purpose is. I may not know, you know, what it what should be my strategy for the next 10 years, but I can probably find something I can do today that will make tomorrow better. And you know, tomorrow can be defined however we want, but at a minimum, let's say you're taking a couple of hours on a Friday. Well, something that I feel like is almost always a good thing to do. This is a good habit, but if you can't yet make it a habit, try it as a one-time thing and see how it works. Look at your schedule for the next week or possibly the next 2 weeks. And what I like to do is say, all right, what do I need to do to prepare for the things that are coming my way? And so I skim the calendar and I say, oh, okay, I'm meeting with this person. Oh, you know what? I need to read that article 
to, because I'm supposed to talk to them about this article. So I need, okay, put this down, read this article. Um, if I'm giving a speech, okay, oh, did I make the deck yet? Did I send the deck to the organizer? Okay, I've got to do that. And, you know, it's just sort of all of these little things. Oh, I'm meeting with the accountant. Oh, that means I need to send him, you know, last year's tax returns. And you do these things and it does actually make your upcoming week or weeks simpler because there's a, there's a lot of things. There's an enormously large number of things that if you have to do them last minute, become a bit of a crisis or an emergency. Mm -hmm. But it, if you do them like three days in advance, then all of a sudden it's like not that hard. Like the uh -huh. difference between doing something three days in advance and doing something like the night before or the hour before on both a practical and an emotional level is actually enormous. And so even just that can make a big difference in your life. Okay. I love that. You talked about strategic patience. What do you mean by that since we're talking strategy? Yeah. So strategic patience is a, is a topic that I have talked about in the long game. And I, I kind of called it out specifically because it it is true. You know, I mean, the unfortunate truth is that if you are working on long-term projects, almost by necessity, they kind of take a long time, right? I mean, mm -hmm. you know, we we might wish that the path, you know, to, you know, whatever the goal is, the path to the C-suite, the path to becoming a multimillionaire, the path to becoming a best-selling author, like, you know, whatever the thing is you're trying to do, it would be great if like, oh yeah, I can do that, you know, in three months, uh, but mostly, mostly not, right? There's, there's a lot of things that, that really do take a number of chess moves and it's over a period of years. They don't happen as fast as we want them to. Mm -hmm. And the, the question we have to ask ourselves is like, all right, you know what, if, if, if I'm actually serious, like if I mean what I say, that this is important to me, then I need to deal with the reality on the ground that this is something that's going to take a while. And I don't have to love that, but that's probably how it is. I mean, it's not to say that a miracle can't happen, but most likely it will probably take quite a while. And so that's where strategic patience comes in. You know, I, I think that Patience has gotten a, a bad rap, I think justifiably so, uh, because a lot of times people in power will use the language of patience as a way of shutting you up. They'll, yeah. you know, they sort of say like, you know, pat, 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 just be patient. It'll, it'll come to you. Don't worry. Just like, you know, stop patting you on the head. Right. I'm saying. Yeah. And, you know, that's obviously not what I'm advocating because, that is uh, that is patronizing. And so, you know, of course, nobody wants to have that done to them. But it's also true that I like to think of strategic patience is essentially just making friends with reality. Sometimes things do take a while and we have to, you know, understand that, be ready for it, cope with it. And then that's what's going to allow us to get the outcome. I love it. Making friends with reality. Uh, I love that. Um, can something I deal with well, you know, I talk about a lot because I want everything to happen overnight. Um, yes. You know, my wife really wants everything to happen overnight. I'm a little bit more patient than that. But still, how on the subject of being patient for you, for instance, how do you set up times to check in to recognize the progress you've made if if you haven't gotten to the absolute goal, uh, do, you, do you know where I'm going with this? This is like how do yeah. you, how can you keep yourself going and reminding yourself that that the patience was worth it? Sure, yeah, absolutely. Because it, it's true. I mean, obviously, once once you've attained the goal, that's that's great. You know, it's like yay, that was that was worth it. I did it. But the hard part, you know, I describe attaining long term goals as almost being like entering a long, dark tunnel. And the problem with this long, dark tunnel is that you don't know how long it is. Ah. You, you can kind of guess sometimes, and something that is really helpful is upfront to try to make as educated a guess as you can about it, you know, by researching what other people have done or, you know, certain milestones or things like that. But we never know for sure, you know, is this, is this tunnel a mile or is it a hundred miles or is a thousand miles? And it, you know, when you're in the thick of it, 
uh, it, it just feels like it's never going to end, which is why a lot of people quit. Mm -hmm. So understanding milestones becomes really critical because otherwise, you know, the great irony is that it feels like the rational choice to quit. I, I hear from so many people, you know, that, that I talk to and they're like, well, you know, I tried it and it, and it didn't work. And they mm -hmm. feel, you know, they feel so good about themselves, you know, like, well, yeah, I tried it. And, you know, you dig a little deeper and, and you come to understand the human mind craves certainty so badly that it often will try to, you know, forcibly create the conditions, even if it's a negative outcome, it feels mm -hmm. better to have that negative outcome than not to know. And so, you know, maybe they like tried the thing. Oh, you know, I tried submitting my book proposal and like, you know, four people turned it down, you know, or whatever. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, well, you know, it just wasn't going to happen. It's like, oh, really? Because actually, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot of authors that, you know, did it 20 times that did it, you know, a mm -hmm. hundred times or that scrapped that proposal and started on another proposal. I mean, you know, it just, it depends how badly you want it. And so to answer your question, there is a concept that I talk about in the long game called looking for the raindrops. And it is essentially identifying in advance and looking for small telltale signs that the ultimate success, you know, in this case, the thunderstorm is coming and they are very subtle. They often literally are a raindrop, which the average person might sort of ignore or like, you know, oh, yeah, it was probably an air conditioner, you know, but you need to train yourself to look for them, what, whatever those signs are. I mean, it could be, if you're trying to get a book deal, it could be something, you know, as small as, oh, wow, you know, I seem to have a trend here where the last few weeks I've had 15% more email subscribers to my list. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that might be five people, right? And, you know, the average person would be like, whatever, it's five people. But you need to look for those signs and those patterns because they actually could be telling you something useful. This actually is a question I I think about a lot, and I don't think I've ever asked anybody. So you hear all the time people say, don't give up before you've already gotten to the end. How do you tell the difference between keeping going so you don't give up too soon and going down a wrong path and that's just that you're wasting time and money and energy on something that's actually you're really never going to get to, you know. Yeah, I mean, this is where, the how do you know when question. it's a blind alley? How do you know when it's time to to pivot to use the the popular term and see what you've learned and maybe you go someplace else? Yeah, it's you're you're asking the right question, Elizabeth. Of course, this is this is the really important thing because you know nobody wants to waste time on you know some stupid quixotic venture. Um, but also you don't want to quit too soon if success is around the corner. Mm -hmm. So how do you know? I will venture to say that there's, that there's really two key elements and where a lot of people go wrong is that they try to figure it out in midstream. They're in the tunnel and they're like, what do I do? What do I do? And the answer is you're in a freaking tunnel. You have no idea. Like anybody's guess, you know, mm -hmm. the, the, if you're in the tunnel, you have, you have no idea. You have no guidance where people go wrong. Is that prior to entering the tunnel, you need to set up a list of criteria. And so one piece is about proper scoping. Mm -hmm. It's about doing enough research. And a lot of people skip this step. They just jump right into it, but it's about understanding. Okay. The thing you're trying to do, has anybody in the world ever done it? And the answer is, you know, probably in most cases, you know, unless we're talking about like intergalactic exploration, most, most things have been done. You know, people have written best-selling books or people have, you know, gotten, um, you know, X, X amount of money to speak on a keynote stage or people have, you know, gotten the big, the big promotion to mm -hmm. SVP or, you know, whatever, whatever they're seeking. And so the question is, okay, can you research, can you identify at least one, but hopefully multiple people who have done it and either because you know them and can ask them, or if you don't using the internet and publicly available sources, which is easier than ever, thankfully reverse engineering and trying to understand like, well, how long did it take them, you know, in between the start and the finish, how long did that take and what did they do? What were the steps? 
and literally just working it back to try to get as much clarity as possible. Now, your path is probably not going to be identical to theirs, but it is useful. You know, if 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 it takes most people 10 years to do something, it's, you know, it's probably not going to take you two years to do it. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I'm not saying it could never happen, but it's probably going to be like, you know, maybe it's nine, maybe it's 11, but, you know, you know the ballpark to expect. And so mm -hmm. that is really useful. And so then knowing that enables you to do part two. And part two is about asking yourself essentially, what can you tolerate? What, you know, are you willing to, you know, okay, if mm -hmm. it takes 10 years, if it takes 12 years, mm -hmm. is it worth it to you? You know, and that's mm -hmm. a really important question. And okay, if the answer is yes, great. Also, it's useful for you to ask, how much can you afford to lose? And, you know, that's a literal thing as well as a metaphorical thing. If you're starting a business, for instance, you may say, you know what, I can afford to lose, you know, up to $100,000 getting this started, mm -hmm. but I can't lose more than that. And so if, you know, if we get to $100,000 and we're still not seeing, you know, X amount of traction or X amount of profit or, you know, whatever, whatever the thing is, then I'm going to pull the plug. And you just create these sort of certain if then conditions. You could also say in terms of, in terms of time or in terms of, you know, effort or, or you know, whatever it is. Um, but it's really important to set the criteria up front so that you're not trapped because when you're in the middle of the cycle, it's it's a it's a terrible time to make decisions. Your your emotions mm -hmm. are very clouded at that point. But you know, I'm curious for you, Elizabeth. How how do you think about these things? I mean, what is what is strategic patience or the arc of achieving long term things look like in your life? Well, I know that um, I will break promises to myself. So you know, my whole life, you know, I'll put something up on the wall, say I am going to do da 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 da. And it doesn't happen, or I stop right. seeing it. So I have to do it with an accountability partner. Um, I have a course called the Visible and Valued Course for Executive Women. It's a leadership certification, actually. And the key part is having somebody else, having a partner, having a cohort who will hold you accountable. Because, uh, you know, I wish I would be accountable to myself, but I'm not. So, you know. I'm good at a lot of things. That's not one of them. <laughs> so that's yeah. one question. The other thing is, um, so I've been through, I've been through the point of saying, this was the thing I built. It was my baby. It was my identity. And it is no longer sustainable. It's time to leave. But it really meant, it was a huge emotional thing. I actually um, hired somebody to work with me to say, can we pivot this company so that we could get something else that will that will work? And after about six months, I said, nah, I think it's time to close. And the coach, the consultant, who was a friend and who had helped me build the company, she said, yeah. I knew that was going to be the answer, but I knew you were going to need those six months to be ready. And yeah, so she, that was a gift she gave me was to say, okay, okay. And you know, you could decide to stop, but it had to, you know, my whole identity was tied up in my company. And we've all seen people like that. And, you know, someone like you and I, we are our product. <laughs> so what I tell my, my clients now is Yes, it's wonderful. And your thought leadership is wonderful. Make sure things change. You change. Don't discount the emotional part of making that decision. Because not being willing to let go of the identity I had built, you know, it really took me a year and a half. But yeah, I'm relationship oriented. You know, I know I will be account accountable to another person. So I had this brilliant consultant. And I just paid her to help me along the path. And that was worth every penny. Yeah, that's such a great point. And, and I, I love that because you really have to know yourself and you have to know what works for you. Everybody's different. Um, for folks who are not familiar with it, um, Gretchen Rubin has a really great uh, book dealing with this called The Four Tendencies. And it's it's basically sort of 
breaking, it's, you could call it kind of a personality assessment, uh, but it sort of breaks down um, different types in terms of your ability to, to self-motivate or like what enables you to get things done. And, you know, one quadrant is the people who like, I make a promise to myself and I keep it. No problem. And these are the people who are just really extremely annoying to everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> it was, yeah. <laughs> And then there's another category, which is like you, which is like, you know what, if I make a promise to somebody else, I'll do it. If I make a promise to myself, eh. And so, you know, the answer there is, you know, you kind of have to learn it over time, but it is relatively straightforward, which is hire the personal trainer. If you want to go to the gym, exactly. get an accountability buddy. If you want to accomplish the business thing that you say that you need to do. And, you know, it, it's, it's just a, a way to, force yourself to do the behavior that you know you need to do. And so learning the tricks to kind of outsmart our own personalities is uh, is really useful. Uh, oh, wow, Dory. I, you know, I've got like four other questions I want to ask you that I'm weird. I might want to respect your time. So if there's one place someone could start, so um, buy the book, The Long Game. We'll put the link in the, it will buy the book. But if someone is listening to this and is motivated right now this minute, where's some place you can start? Yeah, that's that's great. Well, I'm going to give you two answers, Elizabeth. Um, one, um, above and beyond folks who want to dive directly into the long game, is I do have a, a free strategic thinking self-assessment that that you know people can sort of try on and might be helpful. And they can get it for free at doryclark.com slash the long game. Uh, so that's one piece. But I will also say that going back to a point that we made early on in the conversation about uh, about white space and how to create more of it, I have four questions, you know, kind of a checklist that I like to go through personally when a new something, a new possibility, a new invitation, a new engagement is presented to me. Because, you know, so often when something comes in, we, you know, we sort of stress about it. Oh, should I do it? Should I not do it? I don't know. And it becomes really hard. But if you can sort of go through a systematic checklist, it can become faster and easier, just the decision-making process around it. And so the four questions that I like to ask when evaluating something, and I hope it might be helpful to other people. Number one is what is the total commitment being requested? And what I mean specifically is we often kind of make little mental shortcuts. You know, it's like, oh, well, you know, they want to have coffee with me. Okay, well, that's 30 minutes, right? No. I mean, you know, if somebody wants to have coffee with you for if if it's in person, first of all, it's almost never 30 minutes. It's you, you know, let's call it 45 at a minimum. Maybe it's an hour. And depending where it's going to be, you know, maybe it takes you 40 minutes to get there. You've got a park, you do all this stuff and you realize like, oh, this coffee, you know, oh, it'll be quick. Blah, blah, blah. It's actually like a three hour invitation. It's like, do you want to spend half your day with this person? Mm -hmm. That's, you know, worth asking. Number two, what is the physical and emotional cost? Um, your criteria should be higher. Let's say somebody wants to meet with you, Elizabeth. You have just, they want to meet you with you on a day, which is the morning after you've just flown from Austria to Oregon. Mm -hmm. It should actually be a higher bar because you are going to be in bad shape, probably. You know, mm -hmm. if you're like most people, you're going to be jet lagged, you're going to be miserable. If somebody wants to meet with you on that day, it needs to be pretty damn good. Yeah. And number three, uh, what is the opportunity cost? You know, people often just forget this really basic question. It's not should you do it or not. It's what else could you be doing with that time? And is that more valuable? And the final piece is how will you feel about it in a year? A year from now, would you feel regret? Would you be like, gosh, I really missed that opportunity? Or is it actually equally likely that you're like, you know, I, I don't even I don't even remember it. Uh, and though time can be a useful filter as well. I love that last one. Just how will I feel about it a year from now? Was it worth it? That's great. That gets me all into relationships, which was a subject I wanted to dive into, and I never got there. So, um, so um, thank you, Dory Clark. I'm so glad I finally got you. You were, you've been on my wish list for quite some time. So this is yay, hooray! I'm really thrilled this worked out. May the rest of your time today be wonderful. It's early for you as well. And um, this has been Speakers Who Get Results. I'm Elizabeth Bachman, 
If you enjoyed this, please subscribe. Subscribe to the podcast. Check us out on YouTube. Most importantly, leave a review on Apple Podcasts. That's the one that counts. And tell your friends so many more people can hear this really wonderful conversation with the amazing Dory Clark. Thank you, Dory. This is Elizabeth Bachman. I'll see you on the next one. We have just concluded another great episode of Speakers Who Get Results with your host, Elizabeth Bachman. If you got value from today's episode, please feel free to share us with your friends and colleagues. You may also visit elizabethbachman.com for additional resources. Be sure to tune in every week for new episodes. And thanks for tuning in.